Archer, bring me another drink and don't dawdle. He wrinkled his nose at the thought that he might never have to use that expression again, and muttered, of course, dear, to hide his relief. This time, he added the powdered medicine he'd bought at the drugstore while he prepared her drink. After a few careful stirrings, it was ready. He graciously extended his hand and presented Blair with a drink. After taking a sip, she nearly gargled. What is this garbage? It's your Long Island tea. I tried to make it to your liking. What's wrong with it? There's too much booze in it. Your mixing skills are slipping. Seems like lately you can't do anything right. Would you like me to fix another with less alcohol? Nah, I'll manage. Thanks for nothing. After roughly ten minutes of Blair's rambling, Archer had figured out how to ignore her. Her speech was becoming increasingly garbled. His strategy was prepared to be launched. Blair, I need to talk to you. It'll take a while, so please hold off on interrupting. I don't give a damn. I'll say what I... Quickly, Archer went up to her. Blair, I'm gonna slap you as hard as I can if you interrupt me again. Archer's normally soft demeanor had disappeared, surprising Blair. Blair tried to speak again, at first unfazed. I'll... Archer's intense stare crushed her voice. It was clear to her that he meant business. Blair, I'm fed up. What I'm about to do is for your own good, though I doubt you'll agree. Then again, you haven't agreed with me in years. I regret giving in to your pressure for a vasectomy before I was 25 years old. I'm sick of taking the blame for not using a condom, which led to your pregnancy and our marriage. I'm also sick of hearing you talk about suing the pharmaceutical company over a pill baby. Despite having two children, you still haven't fully embraced motherhood. Where is the courageous woman who transformed adversity into an opportunity? Who came running to greet me when I got home? Who made decisions with me and who showed their affection often? Lately, I haven't recognized her. You're so mad that I replace my golf shoes every 10 years? Yet you insist on buying petite outfits that you won't wear for years. Half of your gowns sit in your wardrobe, unworn. I'm sick of hearing about your money woes. It's getting old to be called a useless spouse. Until it's time for bed, I work all day, take care of the kids, and do the chores you refuse to do. I will then address your complaints. Nighttime makes you drowsy, uninterested in closeness, or both. Remember when we were last close? No way. The kids doubt your maternal intentions. When did you help with homework or drive them to activities? Attend parent? Teacher meetings? Show them love and pride? They dread having you around when we go out. They don't want their friends exposed to your scolding for simply enjoying themselves. I regret that you're unhappy with your job, feeling underused despite your superior skills. However, I can't keep listening to how dull it is. I'm aware of your tasks and your boss's attitude, but hearing it repeatedly is grating. Tonight's half-hour rant about an ink pad and leaving work ten minutes late without overtime was too much. In order to gauge the medicine's impact, Archer halted. Because he was igniting a rage, Blair gave the impression of being sleepy yet slightly awake. I'm sorry you dislike our home. We've more than what we had growing up. We're paying the mortgage off early, providing space and safety for the kids. But your negativity makes it feel like a house, not a home. Almost dozing off, Blair was. Now was the moment for the bombshell, Archer decided. I'm aware of you and Jason Vincent at work. Maybe that's why you're uninterested in intimacy. I spoke to his wife, shared evidence of your affair. I contemplated divorce, but financially, you'd benefit more. No divorce. I have another plan. After Blair passed out, Archer realized she couldn't tell how much she had heard. After a fortnight, the asylum. We need to act tonight, Uncle Archer. Keeping someone sedated for so long is dangerous. I know you're a pharmacist, but this could be life-threatening. She might be getting minimal nutrition from the IV bags, but she's starting to lose weight. I suppose I'm prepared enough for tonight. Have you got everything, Jeremy? 
I believe so, Uncle Archer. I really hope this goes as planned. You do realize we could end up in jail for this? Well, that's why you're carrying $15,000 of my money. Risk and reward, you know. I assured you I'd take the blame if things go wrong. I'll come up with a story about blackmail or something. I understand, Uncle Archer. I'll contact you once I'm done, assuming I don't get caught. After assisting Jeremy in changing his wife into the solid-colored jumpsuit that he had packed, Archer went back to his car. All right, Aunt Blair, he said to her lifeless body. We're headed to your new residence. Jeremy took his unconscious aunt and drove to his former workplace, Farmdale Mental Health Facility. Jeremy was relieved to see a familiar face as he pulled up to the front gate guard post. Hey, Jeremy, who've you got there? Hi, Amos. It's Ms. Hensley again. That's odd. I haven't received any notice about an escapee. You know how the front office is trying to avoid negative attention after that medication mix-up lawsuit? Since she always heads to the same place, we knew where to find her. She put up quite a struggle this time, though, so I had to sedate her. All right. Can I see her ID badge? Like always, she tore it off and chucked it somewhere. I'll need to ask the staff to issue her a new one, yet again. Where are you taking her? Back to her ward? Nah, they want her straight to the danger ward. She nicked Dr. Lopez with some scissors during her escape. It was barely a scratch, but he squealed like crazy. That haughty man was do it, the two men said while laughing. I'll give them a heads up that you've got a delivery for them. Jeremy pulled up to the Serenity Building, which housed the secure ward, and heaved a breath of relief. Thanks. Take care. Just one more act to pull off. While his aunt was still under the influence of her sedative, he retrieved a gurney and carefully laid her on top of it. They went in through the main entrance, took the freight elevator up to the third story, and were there to find the more violent patients. The trolley was wheeled to the nurse's station by Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Thought you left for good. What brings you back? Miss the chaos. Nah, just had a change of heart, Trevor. Figured I could use a break, you know. I hear you. I'd do anything to escape this place before my retirement in 11 years. Yeah, the health insurance keeps reeling me in. They both laughed and said, true that. So, who've you got there, Jeremy? This one's a new addition. Mary Hensley. Been on Ward A3 for a while. What landed her in the danger zone? She cut Dr. Lopez while making a break for it. I hope she got him good, that smug guy. Only nicked him, but he's acting like he deserves a bronze star alongside a purple heart. Damn, I've got a trunk full of purple hearts. Was darn near close to death a couple of times. What did I get? Good job, Trevor, and a pat on the back. I'd give anything to stick Dr. Lopez in a room without his muscle. Call it a dose of reality therapy. As much as I'd love to chew the fat with you, Trevor, where should I put Ms. Hensley, you've got the transfer paperwork? I haven't received anything on her yet. Yeah, I know. Doctor. Lopez was throwing such a fit. He hasn't filled it out. He demanded I bring her right away and said he'd send the paperwork later. I wasn't going to argue after he wrote me up for insubordination last time. What a shit. Okay. What about her night meds? Handled already. You won't need to give her anything until morning. It should all be sorted by then. What should I know if she wakes up? Is she likely to attack or cause a scene? Usually not too bad. I think, doctor. Lopez finally pushed her buttons too far. Probably his sparkling bedside manner. The main thing about her is her belief that she's someone else. Lately, she's been going by Blair McKenzie. It's a dissociative disorder. They used to call it multiple personalities. Quite rare. She's created this whole other life and can spin tales about her family and job. She's adamant about not belonging here insists her husband put her here, and swears she's not insane. 
She'd pass a lie detector test because she genuinely believes it. If a stranger heard her story, they'd probably fall for it. Hook, line, and sinker. I've got another one like that in 309. Thinks she's Jacqueline Kennedy, insists on seeing the president every day. I'm hoping we get a patient claiming to be Jeff and watch the sparks fly. Room number, Trevor? Let me check. Put her in 344. The mattress might be lumpy, but it's tidy. I hope she keeps it down. It's the room closest to us, and I need my beauty sleep, you know. Blair was shown to room 344 by Jeremy. I'm sorry, Aunt Blair. I hope Uncle Archer knows what he's doing. He breezed through security into the building, making a beeline for the airport to catch a flight to a nation that does not have an extradition treaty. Being a male nurse, gave Jeremy the confidence he needed to pursue his lifelong dream of traveling. He had put aside a considerable amount of money in addition to the gift from Uncle Archer. The effects of the medication had worn off by dawn. Blair had a hard time understanding what was going on around her. There was a complete lack of familiarity with the room's pale green walls. Her gaze shifted to her clothing. Who dressed me in these terrible clothes? Where are my own? A great dread gripped Blair. Initially, she believed she was hallucinating. She tried to stand up, but her legs felt surprisingly weak. As she cautiously investigated her bare new surroundings, illuminated by a single overhead light, she attempted to open the door but discovered that it was locked and had no internal release. Her desperate banging and cries for assistance were the only outcomes of her efforts to open it. After what seemed like an eternity, Trevor's voice echoed through the doorway. You better keep quiet, Mary, or I'll have to find a way to calm you down. In response, Blair said, I am not Mary. I am Blair, and I will kick the door in the face if you refuse to open it. Clarity was lacking in her statement. Good attempt, Mary, the voice said with a grin. Take a bow. You have been warned. Everyone's trying to sleep, stated the captain. Despite the warning, Blair disregarded it and made a fuss, which resulted in the door opening. However, instead of freedom, she was detained by one assistant while another gave her an injection. Blair, or Mary as she was called, promptly went back to sleep, and Trevor moaned to himself, What a pain. My body was slumbering. It is now my responsibility to complete the chemical restraint report. The following morning, chief psychiatrist Dr. Esteban Lopez, who had escaped the scissors unharmed, was making his rounds in the secure ward. He was in a rush, wanting to avoid these people as much as possible while still making sure he could bill for his time. His current position as head of clinical services at Farmdale was the best he could get after facing accusations of dubious counseling methods in his private practice. He had six months left on his one-year probation, so he wanted to move quickly. As he passed room 344, marked as vacant in his log, the accompanying ward aide informed him that there was now a patient inside. A nurse's response to his question on the patient's identity was Mary Hensley. In spite of seeing hundreds of patients, Dr. Lopez had trouble remembering their names. Instead, he interacted primarily with staff and prescribed medication according on their evaluations, and he did not engage in individual therapy. Has she lost her file? It hasn't arrived yet. As he continued his rounds, he exclaimed, I can't imagine her without it. Blair, or Mary as she was called, spent the morning trying to piece together how she had gotten herself into this strange place. Since her husband was the last person she remembered speaking to, he might know something, even if he wasn't directly involved. She vaguely remembered Archer bringing up Jason, but she was certain that Archer couldn't have known about her connection with Jason. Clearly, her presence here was due to something else. Could it have been an unusual side effect of her medicine that made her lose touch with reality? How had she gotten here? Thinking about it made the mysteries deeper and didn't provide any answers. Blair felt more terrified than before, as if she were stuck in quicksand with a lifeline hanging precariously above her. Blair, posing as Mary, 
wanted to know why the door was locked and where she was, so she tried a fresh tactic. She softly knocked on the door. A voice from the new staff member answered. This time a woman's voice said, Mary, you're back in Farmdale, just like you were all those years ago. You were sent to this ward from Ward A3 for the sake of your own and others' safety. Your breakfast, medication list, and medical history are still missing. I will make preparations for your dinner now that you are awake. You said, Ward, is this a hospital? Some people call it a sanatorium. Indeed, it is classified as a mental health facility. Asylum is the more traditional name, and I like it. A sense of calm and peace washes over you. When Blair heard the news, his anger erupted. A lunatic asylum? Who handed me this? Isn't that my husband? It's not me. Mary is an insult. Please stop using it. Now, Mary, please relax. My love, what name would you rather have? Blair Mackenzie's name is Blair. Here is my address. 4000. 993 Cedar Street. My spouse's name is Archer McKenzie. The world has two little ones under my care. Why am I even here? That is the mystery to me. My spouse and I were chatting in the living room last night when I suddenly lost consciousness. Have him confess by contacting the authorities. My darling, we will take care of that. By the way, would you prefer your breakfast to be served with milk? Coffee or juice? Let me go home, and I want this door to be open. There was silence. Hello? Is that you? Mary, I'm sorry, Blair, but you need to step away from the door so we can bring your breakfast in, the knocker said, 30 minutes after the previous ring. While you slept in, it grew frigid. Sure, I'll be right in. Blair sprung from her bed, knocked over the tray, shoved the assistant aside and dashed out the doorway. Halfway down the corridor, she spotted a towering black guy by the nurse's station, and he snatched her up in his strong arms. You are wise beyond that, Miss Hensley. Are you ready to go back to your room without worrying? Or is Luther here needed to help you? Enough with you, you scumbag. If you hold me against my will, I will sue you all. Blair was restraining and administered another injection. After she calmed down, she was wheeled back to room 344, where she slipped into a haze and was forgotten for a few hours. By noon, the staff in the danger ward were becoming increasingly concerned about Mary's missing paperwork and medications. Instead of bothering Dr. Lopez about the paperwork, they contacted the director of nursing, Don, about the medications. Upon reviewing the records, the Don discovered that Mary Hensley had supposedly received her meds in Ward A3 as scheduled. However, the Don suspected that the record might not be accurate because the aide responsible for administering the medications would typically mark off all the charts in advance to save time, even before they were administered. The aide was summoned and claimed to have given Is Hensley her pills, recalling waking her up for it. She also insisted that Mary was in Ward A3, not the secure ward. According to the Don's suspicions, Dietary Services was contacted that morning to find out where Mary Hensley's breakfast had been delivered. Dietary disclosed that they had sent two breakfasts to Ms. Hensley, one to A3, and another to the secure ward. Presuming that she had been transferred and sending meals to both wards to accommodate her breakfast needs, the Don confirmed her familiarity with the patient by inspecting Mary Hensley and her ID badge in Ward A. 3. Then she went to the secure ward to see the person called Mary Hensley. Looking at the woman in bed, the Don saw that she didn't look anything like the Mary Hensley in a 3 or any other patient she could remember. The most important thing was that the woman didn't have an identification badge, which is required for every patient. The request for the patient's chart in room 344 came up empty. No paperwork or medications had been received. Reviewing the only documentation available, the chemical restraint forms left the Don visibly distressed. Her next stop was the administrator's office. Excuse me, 
Carrington. We're dealing with a major problem. Darla, listen up. I don't want any bad news, so make it disappear. Darla understood his implication. It can't be that dire. Excuse me. We have an unidentified patient in the secure ward who has been sedated three times in the past 24 hours. Carrington, please take note of this. What? Are you saying that a random person just showed up and asked if they could stay for free? He made an effort to brighten the atmosphere despite the seriousness of the situation. In no world. It's important that we handle this quickly. I don't know what's going on. But I don't want the administrator to think she and she are concocting an unsuitable situation. Mr. Hello, Carrington. I apologize. What do you think we should do? I dozed off for a second. His protruding pants proved Darla's assumptions. As soon as she wakes up, we... Is she dreaming? She's been sedated. By whose hand? The people working here. Not once, but three times. Has she been sedated? Upon her arrival at the secure ward last night, and twice again this morning, who gave the orders? Upon admittance to the secure ward, all patients are required to obtain a prawn order for sedatives. But here's the rub. Neither her identity nor the name under which she was admitted are known to us. The patient's name that she provided does not correspond to anyone in our database. She told the staff that the name she gave was for a fictional character. I worry that we've ignored her even though she might be telling the truth. We don't know her and we don't know why she's here. Darla, I want everyone who had contact with her in the conference room in an hour, Mr. Carrington was now motivated to take action. It makes no difference to me if that includes night shift employees. Warn them that their employment is in jeopardy if they don't turn up. All parties concerned finally met around one in the afternoon. Carrington started by saying, All right, now that we're all here, it appears that... Trevor, this isn't a classroom. That was the end of the morning meeting. Raise your hand if you wish to talk. Currently, what are you thinking about? We're not all here. Explain yourself. Who isn't there? Jeremy, Jeremy Atwell. Is that Jeremy Atwell? I thought he was the nurse that left a month ago. He has left the company. Well, he's the one who brought Mary Hensley to the danger. Ah, secure ward last night. Bringing an unnamed person into this hospital and assigning her a bed without any paperwork or screening is what I'm getting at, Carrington says with a heavy sigh, since the cause of her outbursts is likely due to her lack of understanding of where she is, we give her three doses of psychiatric medication. Is everyone here aware of the potential liability? Is the word unemployment in everyone's vocabulary? Who can say jail time? The meeting concluded with threats of consequences, the most severe of which was for anyone disclosing details about the incident, even though the incident was not part of the official record. Suggestions were made to avoid a repeat, and the committee in charge of formulating policies was assigned the task of investigating protocol violations. The administrator and the director of nursing went back to the office to try to find out how to deal with the mystery patient without getting sued. Carrington sat back in his chair, seeming distressed. But then he smirked. Darla asked, I've had enough. I'm giving up. What is funny? Carrington smirked and immediately straightened up. Darla, give it some thought. A crafty woman broke into our facility, trespassed onto our private property, and claimed to be mentally sick in order to get free medical treatment. That is fraud and trespassing. It's really outrageous. It's a crime. In my opinion, she ought to be prosecuted for this. It didn't take long for the Don to figure it out. You honestly believe the sheriff would believe that? Would you? He should think about it after my involvement in his previous campaign. Dear Marcy, please connect me with the sheriff. Blair McKenzie was taken into an interrogation room by the sheriff and another officer shortly after she yelped for help. She was asked to produce identification, which she dutifully did. The sheriff appeared pleased to learn that her home address was in a different county. 
when she tried to ask herself some questions, she was reminded that she was the one being questioned. At last, she was allowed to speak after two hours of being in a room with bars on one wall, terrifying her with a wave of fear, Blair asked. I take it this is a prison, isn't it? With obvious discomfort, what brings me to this place? You have been accused of trespassing and theft, the sheriff said. What? I very assuredly did not do any acts of trespassing or theft. Nothing belongs to me, and I certainly don't claim anyone else's. From what did I allegedly steal? You stole services from our local mental health facility, Farmdale? I did no such thing. Without authorization, you were discovered on private property that is clearly marked as off-limits. You committed theft by deceit when you used our mental and pharmaceutical services without providing us with the necessary documentation of your admittance or payment. It was expected that you would be present. Do you possess any proof of that? Is it something like an insurance approval or a recommendation from a doctor? No way. I chose not to be there. I was abducted and left there by some invisible force. I blame my scumbag husband. Now you're accusing your husband of kidnapping you. Can you provide any proof of that? Or perhaps just identification? Oh, no? In my purse is my driver's license. It is likely that the abductor, S, took it or forgot it at their house. At least one more kidnapper has been located. Your tale is ever evolving. Listen, I'm confused about what transpired. Discover my spouse and interrogate him, not me. Put him in prison. I would like to hear his rationale for my absence from home. Do you really want me to contact your abductor and inquire about the abduction of you? Perhaps it was the correct decision to get help for mental health issues. You're misrepresenting what I said. I won't claim he did it for sure. The final person I spoke to was simply him. Find out by calling him. Now, how do I get his number? Well, I... I am not sure. Even your own husband's phone number eludes you. Already, your credibility was poor. Now it's at an all-time low. Mobile phones are used by us, you moron. They have our numbers stored in them. His is on my phone, but I can't recall it. B. Respectful. Arraignment can take place in 48 hours so I can hold you. Would you like that? I don't have your cell phone, she said, shaking her head. The kidnappers took it or left it. Let's give it another shot. Does your husband's work number ring a bell with you? Good luck with that. On weekends, they are not present. What about this weekend? Do you have any idea what day it is? The following Sunday? Surely so. Not at all. Could you please tell me the date? I'm just curious. What gives with your inane inquiries? Sunday, May 20th is the date. You should have stayed in Fairdale, my dear. The 9th of June has already passed. What? I've made a... How come I've lost two weeks? By the way, where had I gone? Her tears began to fall. So, you believe you've been gone for two weeks and can't remember a thing that happened during that time. The problem is that nobody in your purported family has ever filed a missing persons report. Recently, I looked through the state's missing persons registry. The credibility of your story is dwindling. Fairdale most likely does not want you back, regardless of how present you are. I pray you are related to someone who does. And what about the number that your husband uses for work? Are you aware of it? Surely he is currently working? My cell phone also has his work number. Just a moment. I have a number that could be useful. This is my desk. You can count on me to remember that number. Telephone number 555. 298 4415 to reach the loan department press 4 our secretary alberta ought to respond the numbers for our home and husband are in her possession an alberta number was phoned hello loan department blair here alberta your voice is pleasant to hear you mean blair mckenzie right 
It seemed like you were let go or fired. So stated Mr. Anderson. I don't understand. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to expound. I need you to look up my husband's number in your records. You don't know the... Just get the damn number. Hold on a second. Your rudeness and yelling at me are very unacceptable. I am unable to disclose any information about you or any other current or past employee at this time due to the fact that you are no longer employed here. Oh, and I have no idea who you are. I'm not even sure Blair McKenzie exists. To be honest, Blair, I say goodbye. Constant griping was all you did. Blair, poor Blair. We had had enough. A pizza party was even planned for the day you left. Apologies, Blair, or whatever you are. But I'm not much of a help. Leave it. Enjoy your day. Please contact my parents, Blair pleaded, her voice quivering with emotion. That person can look at their phone. They have his number saved in their cell, she said, passing her mother's number on. At least one call is all that's required by law, according to the sheriff. I promise to behave myself, all right? I assure you, he said as he called her number. Hello, mother. Kindly provide me a hand. Did Archer contact you? I am the one who has. Not to mention how let down I am. Informing me of your actions, he and the kids dropped by. I feel terrible. Your husband and children loved you, Blair. If I helped you, Archer said, I'd never see my grandchildren again. You made your bed. Now lie in it. It's something I never imagined saying to my kid. With questions like what's happening and why me, Blair began to cry. She sobbed for a long as the words grew clearer and darker. It was as though Archer was aware of her and Jason. Is there a landline in your neighborhood? The sheriff inquired. Blair thought about Vicky for a second. Harned Vicky. A landline remains in her and her husband's possession. Her number, though, eludes me. A possible place to look in a phone book could be a landline, the sheriff said. Her name and address, please. It might solve this situation, the sheriff said, his relief evident as he heard Blair's address. He resided in a separate county. Vicky, it's Blair. Oh, come on. I hope you and your loved ones are doing well. Your cell phone went to voicemail every time I tried to reach you. I would have preferred that you broached the subject of moving. It seemed like you were a fugitive from justice, so suddenly you were gone. Did your husband get busted for selling drugs? People in the neighborhood are talking about it. What? Exactly who shifted positions? Seems like Archer and the kids took off. Is the pharmacy an option? I thought everyone had relocated. For sale is written on the darkened house. You can find another pharmacist's number displayed at the closed pharmacy. I don't understand what's going on. I am not really certain. I feel like Archer is getting even with me because of something he claims I did. What I've gone through is unbelievable, Vicky. No one else will help me at this time. Because of what Archer told my mom, she no longer wants to talk to me. Would it be okay if I stayed at your residence until I resolved this? Oh, I am so desperate for it. I can't say that I blame him. You made it a point to be critical of your husband at every single community event. We learned about his private life after he had a few beers. No way he hasn't filed for a divorce at this point. As for helping you, someone like me, a homemaker might not be your style. I doubt I can make my house presentable for someone as important as you. Blair was desperate after experiencing yet another rejection. Vicky, I'm sorry if I've upset you. You've been a great neighbor. I really need your help. Please forgive me and help me get home. I'll need to ask my husband. He's not thrilled with you either. He'll want to know when and for how long. I'm not sure. I'm currently in jail in Caldwell County. In jail? Oh dear, what happened? Nothing. I swear. It's a long story. Can you possibly come get me? Coming to get you is another story? Where's your car? It should be in our garage at home. 
If it's not there, I have no idea where it could be, stepped in the sheriff. I can take you to the county line and hand you over to the Madison County Sheriff to take you home. Would you protect and serve? Until she thought about something, Blair felt hopeful. What about the charges here, Mrs. Mackenzie? If you agree not to take legal action against Farmdale, they'll drop the charges. Just sign this form, releasing them from any legal liability, and I'll take you to Madison County. But I think I might have legal grounds against Farmdale. I wasn't supposed to be. Back to your cell, ma'am. You've decided to stay with us for now. Fine. I'll sign it. Just get me out of here. The Madison County Sheriff was the one who paused during the encounter. You didn't mention she's from Farmdale. Is she dangerous? No, she's not. Put her in the back seat in cuffs if you want. Just take her to this address and be done with it. I'll appreciate it. You owe me for this. Blair made it home at last. Vicky, I can't express how relieved I am to see you. Blair, what's with the attire? Is that prison wear? It's not prison gear. It's from the asylum. Well, that's not much of an improvement. Do you have any clothes that might fit me? You'd actually consider wearing the goodwill stuff I have. Sorry, none of those would work. I might still have that mumumu Daryl brought back from Hawaii. It makes me look like I'm hiding extra weight, so I never wore it. Anything for the moment. I'm sorry to bother you, but Vic, would you mind letting me use your phone for a second? Luckily, Vicky had saved Archer's mobile phone number in her contacts. When Blair tried to call it, a notice saying no longer in service came up. Then, as a precaution, she went to the pharmacy. It was specified in the tape that all of Archer McKenzie's patients were to pick up their medications at CVs. Vicky, I'm heading over to the house to check if any of my things are left behind. They must have left something. Blair, who was ravenous, went to get some food and then walked down to her house. More so than before, it seemed to be beckoning. It had been a stable place for her family, so she wondered why she had been critical of it before. Compared to the sanatorium and prison rooms, it was noticeably better. The sight of the for sale sign, though, swiftly crushed her enthusiasm. Neither the name nor the phone number of the realty agency were recognized. Since I couldn't find a key, I figured breaking in would have to do. It was locked from the front and the back. With great care to avoid hurting herself, she reached in and used an edged stone to break the window next to the rear doorknob, allowing herself to enter. She then tried the alarm security code. Glancing into the refrigerator, she saw that it was bare, but for condiments. No meat, eggs, or other necessities. As she turned on the kitchen light, just the Keurig and the pods she loved were left. The living area was devoid of any furniture. Why sell the house if all the furniture's still here? Are Archer and the kids planning to return? Or did they leave too hastily to take it? Maybe they left it furnished to expedite the sale. As she made her way upstairs, she saw that not only were all of the children's and Archer's clothes missing, but so were her own. They've erased me. When she returned downstairs, she said, Where the hell are they? This is giving me a headache. I need to find out where my family is and if they intend to come back. Afterwards, she noticed a note, her cell phone, and Archer's wedding ring on the kitchen table. She grabbed the letter and started reading, Listen, Blair. If you believe that everything that happened between you and Jason was completely responsible for what happened to you, you're only partially correct. Finding out about your affair just confirmed what I'd already decided. My main issue, and the reason I'm leaving, is that you treat us and your life with us with such contempt. I dare you to think of a single time in the past three years when you've complimented me, our children, our house, your job, or anything else about our lives. Your only apparent joy seems to be in purchasing clothes that are too small for you and Jason's company. By the way, I told his wife, so he might not be too happy with you right now. 
She was very angry over the phone. As a family, we have departed. For how long is anybody's guess? We plan to travel quite a bit. I have changed my phone number and decided to pay for everything with cash so you won't be able to track us. We also withdrew most of the funds from our joint account. If you really want me to consider staying married, you can convince me when we get back. I would expect you to file for a divorce if you are not interested in staying married. Unauthorized medication use, unlawful imprisonment, and other offenses may also lead to an arrest. Honestly, it makes no difference to me which path you take. The last thing I want is for things to stay the same. For a long time, my advice didn't matter to you, so I'm not hopeful now. My recommendation is that you think about what you've lost and what you can lose by expecting the world to accommodate you without returning the favor. Thank you. Archer. Several calls had gone unanswered from Jason, but she had received zero from Archer when she checked her cell phone. Jason just left a brutal voicemail in which he blamed her for his wife's divorce threats and his job loss. His only interest in continuing their relationship was in inflicting her excruciating agony. Blair buried her head in her hands, her grief shattered by the sudden blare of police sirens. The sirens, which usually don't bother her, stopped at her house this time. Even though they have before warned others of danger, three firearms were pointed at Blair as she walked up to the door. They ordered her to freeze, hands up, and she did just that. One police officer said, Who are you and why are you in this area? Simultaneously, I'm Blair McKenzie, and this is my home. The security firm informed us the house was empty. The family's gone. Show us some ID proving this is your house. Damn it, I don't have any. It was all taken from me when I was abducted. And... She stopped short, fearing the consequences of revealing her experience at Farmdale Mental Health Facility. Kidnapped? We haven't had any kidnapping reports for months. If this is your place, where's your house key? I don't have it on me. It was in my wallet. Any photos inside with you in them? Proving you live here? Yes, plenty of pictures. Officer Lopez, please follow her inside and remain close, the co-commanded. Blair went inside the room and looked across the mantel, past the wedding picture of her and Archer. Never again. Nothing remained of the picture gallery that had been lining the staircase. Neither her albums nor any woman's attire could be found in the residence. She seemed to have vanished. No one was there to attest to her character, including Vicky and the other known neighbors. Some of Blair's neighbors had been there for decades, but he had never made an effort to get to know them. We'll need to take you in until we sort this out. You're under arrest on suspicion of breaking and entering. For now, Blair her eyes watering, walked to the prison. I had the good sense to commit Vicky's number to memory before I left the house, so all it took was one call to get her when she got there. Vicky returned home a few hours later and collected Blair upon her release on recognizance. Blair stood out among the other female prisoners in the holding cell who all assumed the woman in the flowery Moo 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 was mentally disturbed. In the end, someone got in touch with Vicky and she confirmed that Blair lived at the property she had entered. Curling up in bed and sobbing herself to sleep, Blair withdrew to Vicky's apartment, then dropped Vicky off at work the following morning, while still wearing the moo, moo and then drove Vicky's car to the bank. Everyone from customers to staff was staring at Blair's outfit. She went to a teller to withdraw money from her account, but they insisted on seeing identification first. Blair walked over to Wanda Jones's desk, delighted that Wanda recognized her without asking for identification. I'm so grateful. It's been a nightmare, Blair admitted. Wanda consoled before going online to look into Blair and Archer's finances. Wow, there's been a significant change in your accounts recently. What do you mean? All your joint accounts have been emptied except for a few hundred dollars. Who did that? Your husband, about a week ago. Do you have any other accounts in your name only? No. How could he take all the money? It was mine, too. Joint accounts allow either party to withdraw funds. They don't require both signatures. 
Sounds like there's trouble between you two, apparently, but I don't get why he was so spiteful. Is there any way I can access some money? You can get what's left, but don't you work? Perhaps they can provide an advance on your pay? Good idea? I was heading there next. Blair saw Alberta on her way to work at the lending company where she was employed. They looked at one other with contempt before Alberta finally spoke up, asking, What's with the Hawaiian queen attire? Save it, Alberta. Not in the mood. I'm here to see Mr. Anderson. Coming to beg for your job back, huh? Blair drew near, her exasperation plainly visible. I'm here to address your phone manners. I'll see if he wants to talk to you. Mr. Anderson, there's a peculiarly dressed woman claiming to be Blair McKenzie. She rudely demanded to speak to you. No, I don't know what she wants. Okay, I'll ask. M's. Mackenzie, Mr. Anderson wants to know the reason for your visit? Alberta relayed the message, saying, I want to know why I'm suddenly jobless here. I didn't quit. If I was fired, I was never informed. Alberta hesitated for a second before indicating that she could go inside without bringing coffee, as is customary for guests. She was not invited to sit by Mr. Anderson. Blair, you've got some nerve showing up after quitting without notice. I hope you're not here asking for your old position. We've already filled it. He grinned. Nice outfit, by the way. Just back from a Hawaiian getaway? It's a long story. And I haven't been on vacation unless you consider a trip to hell a vacation. Never mind. I'm here to figure out why you thought I resigned. I was kidnapped and held captive. Everything's changed at home. I never intended to leave my job. What made you think I wanted to quit? I have your file here. Look, this is a copy of an email from your address, resigning abruptly. Pretty harsh language, too. Blair hurriedly read over the paperwork. Mr. Anderson, I swear I didn't send this. It must have been my husband. I never felt this way about my job or anyone here, especially not you. We've both been deceived. I don't know why. I want my job back. I need my job back. Alongside your resignation, there's the issue with your involvement with Jason. We've terminated his employment. There was deliberation about letting you go too, but given Jason's supervisory role over you, we had to consider the possibility of coercion. There might be a chance for you to retain your position, but you'll have to agree not to pursue legal action. I have to be honest. The relationship between Jason and me was consensual. I wouldn't sue over the affair unless I'm no longer employed here. My husband drugged me, had me committed, then left me with no resources, so I desperately need this job. As for your job satisfaction, We've received numerous complaints about your discontent with your role and colleagues. Apparently, there were frequent disputes, and the staff here wasn't pleased with the constant friction. I believe they even celebrated your departure. If you can substantiate your abduction story, I suppose I can justify you retaining employment here if someone deceived us about your resignation. However, I've already filled your previous position, and I can't retract that offer. Why not? She couldn't have been here that long. She's connected to headquarters. If I dismiss her, I risk losing my job. Can you tell me about my final paycheck? He said. I'll call her and find out. After a short conversation, he sent Blair to the payroll department. Hey, Blair. What's up with the Hawaiian getaway? Look, I don't have time to explain. Is there any money owed to me that hasn't been sent to the bank yet? I'll check, but wouldn't you prefer it deposited? It's safer that way. No, I need the money immediately. Well, Mr. Anderson said to assist you, even though it's extra work on my end. I'm sorry to trouble you, Brenda, but I really, really need the money. It's an emergency. Okay. Yes, you do have some pending funds. Come back in about an hour, and I'll have it for you. Just bear in mind, since you didn't work the last full pay period, 
the amount will be less than usual. Understood. Thank you. During the hour, long ride in Vicky's automobile, Blair's mind was a whirlwind of thoughts. What's happening? How did I become my husband's adversary? He didn't act like anything was wrong before that night. Or did I miss it? Why wait to bring up my relationship with Jason? We were just talking about my job that Friday. And then he suddenly gets irritated, criticizing me for not being the perfect wife and mother, accusing me of constant complaints, which I know I don't do. I remember him mentioning Jason, and then I blacked out. Archer must have done something during those two weeks. Two weeks just vanished. Where was I? What's happening to me? Why? What does Archer want? A divorce? Why go through all this if that's what he wants? Do I want one now? After what he did? My head's pounding. Why is this happening? At that moment, it hit her. The thought of going back to her hometown and all the old grumblings she had made before, things she truly valued such as her husband and children, even though she frequently berated them. Maybe they were tired of my griping. But kidnapping me? Sending me to a mental hospital? That's extreme, even if Jason was a factor. At the end of the hour, she picked up the check and went back to the bank to create an account in her own name while keeping some cash on hand. An Atom debit card was given to her. Off to Walmart. Blair didn't usually shop there, but she was feeling discouraged after hearing criticism of her mumumu and confused about what had happened to her old clothes. Also, the new Blair was careful not to go over budget. She opted not to buy too many new clothes because she was afraid her old wardrobe would still remain at home, so she spent most of the money on meals and clothes. After returning home, Blair changed into clean clothes, put them away in an orderly fashion, and then thoroughly searched the premises. When she got to the garage, she was relieved to see a number of big boxes next to her car. She hoped some of them had her stuff. Hurriedly making her way to the vehicle, she futilely sought for a key. All of the drawers in the house were part of her search. At last, her pocketbook with her driver's license and car key was located in a kitchen cabinet drawer nestled among a dozen keys. A minor triumph. No more reliance on Vicky's car or new locks. She was satisfied with this and went to make a sandwich before retiring to her own bed, expecting Archer to be there but instead experiencing disappointment and more tears. She began to go through a few of the boxes the following Saturday, but there were a lot of them. A moment of hesitation passed as she came upon the photo album and picture box. Relocating it to the living room, she sank into her recollections for hours, experiencing a range of emotions from laughter to sorrow. On her knees, she prayed earnestly for the safe return of her loved ones. She retrieved her clothing from the basement and stowed them up upstairs. Blair went through a series of emotional lows and highs during the following two weeks. Feeling comforted by watching classic TV shows and movies didn't last long when the cable was cut due to financial concerns. An electrician cost her $100 to verify that her power had been shut off and the lights went off as well. She used some of her spare cash to get the power back on and the rest went toward getting a new, more basic cell phone plan to replace the one that had expired. Until she could secure a better position, her previous employer put her to work doing night maintenance. Although it fell short of her prior earnings, it assisted in meeting her critical financial obligations. Blair managed to keep herself busy enough to avoid wallflowering and get enough sleep at night by waitressing breakfast and lunch on top of everything else. While all was going on, she kept thinking about how she could have provoked Archer to respond so violently. She started paying Vicky back over time by recognizing her constant support and promising to return the favor for the friendship she hadn't done enough to return. After coming to appreciate the priceless support that friends like Vicky might provide, Blair resolved to be more compassionate at work. One of her guiding principles became gratitude. After reading Norman Vincent Peale's book several times that day, she would go back to her everyday interactions and reflect on them. She promised herself that the next day she would apologize for her rudeness and make sure it didn't happen again. 
The consequences of alienating others were clear to her as a result of Archer's deeds, and she resolved never to assume that role again. She made great strides in reducing her tendency to grumble. She prayed for half of what she had degraded before, but she still cried every night for her kids and husband, who weren't there. Then one night, she was startled awake by noise downstairs. Carefully descending, Blair wore her robe and held her daughter's softball bat. It is unusual for intruders to leave lights on, so this was a surprise. She knew her relatives had come back when she heard familiar voices. It appears like you've decided to play night softball, Archer commented. All the kids yelled out, Mommy, and hurried over to give her a bear hug. As Blair sobbedly held them, she noticed that Archer showed no signs of wanting even an embrace, much less a kiss. Great to see you, Mommy. We're starving, but we've got a lot to tell you about our trip. Yeah, Dad's got a girlfriend. Shush, dummy. We're not supposed to talk about that, Archer said. She's not a girlfriend exactly. We met her in Arizona. She has kids the same age. They've become close friends, and their house had a pool where the kids learned to swim. She sure acted like she was your girlfriend. The homecoming of Blair's family brought her immense delight, but she was also terrified that her husband had chosen to abandon her. Her thoughts were racing with conflicting emotions. Blair, do you want to talk now or in the morning? I'll sleep in the guest room. Should I lock the door to prevent any sudden attacks? Wouldn't hurt, but how, why? You, it sounds like you need some time to figure out what to ask and what insults to hurl at me. Deservedly so, I admit. Archer, I doubt I can sleep tonight. I'd like to talk as soon as possible. All right, let's get the kids settled first. The children rushed over to embrace their mother as soon as they finished eating, filling her in on all the exciting details of their trip and the moments they missed. After dragging their bags behind them, they made their way to bed. At the kitchen table, Archer and Blair sipped their coffees. So, Blair, what do you want to start with? Why, Archer? You must really despise me to do that. Was I truly such a terrible wife and mother? Yes, you were. I grew weary. No, sick and tired, literally, of your complaints about our life and family. We had a good life, Blair. You had a good life. Maybe not the most thrilling, but damn it, objectively good. I just couldn't bear all your issues. And when I found out about your affair, I guess I lost it. You were right to act, Archer. I took you and the kids for granted. I'm sorry. I know cheating spouses often say this, but with Jason, it was just physical. It was an escape from my roles as a wife, mother, and colleague. He offered an outlet where I could just feel without the responsibility. It was pleasure in return, not an excuse, but a flaw. During your absence, I've worked hard to address it. I'd like a chance to prove I've changed. You don't need to worry about Jason, Archer. I don't love him, nor do I have any intention of being with any man except you. I've only ever loved you, even during the affair, and I still do. I wish there was a foolproof way for me to regain your trust. I'd do anything for that chance. Is there any possibility of forgiveness and starting anew? Archer seemed flustered. Maybe you desire retribution for what happened. It's all right. I assumed that risk when I narsed you and kept you for weeks until I arranged for your placement in the mental health hospital. Blair, I don't know why I did it. I hoped that by shocking you into seeing the results of your choices, you would understand the gravity of the situation and the loss you were causing by putting your freedom and nearly everything else at risk. My information suggests that my strategy might have been somewhat successful. Your next move, based on what you've hopefully learned, is entirely up to you. I don't know what you've learned at this point. I really hope you're going to try to frame me for a bunch of felonies because of what I did but I've had enough of dealing with your problems, and I really don't care. The idea of going back to our unhappy home life is enough to make me choose jail over spending a few months with our kids, 
and I'll draw strength from those memories while I'm behind bars. While I'm in prison, Blair, you may go ahead and get a divorce. What is remaining can be yours. Our savings and checking account were both drained by my actions. My initial intention was to spend a shorter amount of time away, but after finding out about you and Jason, I felt less of a need to hurry back. I was worried about your financial condition while I was away, and the fact that the kids have to start school is the main reason we're back. I plan to use my 401k to help cover the kids' bills since I won't be able to work while in prison. Perhaps Jason might pitch in and help you out financially. Archer, I must confess that I consider doing worse than locking you up. Even now, I occasionally have bursts of rage. To gain an obstinate mule's attention, smack it between the eyes with a 2x4, my grandfather used to say. Well, you used one heavy 2x4 on me. I was jolted to my very core by your blow. To you and the children, I owe a great debt of gratitude. Jason and I have finished. Neither the present nor the future holds any possibility of me being with any other man. At home, you are required. I have no intention of divorcing you or filing charges against you in the event that the police question you. Thankfully, I can't have the family I want if you're behind bars. I wish I could see you incarcerated, but I want you to be my prisoner. In light of my actions, I've thought about what could encourage you to remain and raise our children together. How about I threaten to have you sent to jail? Are you aware of the statute of limitations for kidnapping? Should you think about that every morning before work, hoping for your freedom will be a gift from me. But I'm not going to do that. If you truly desire to be here, then I will let you. If we can mend our family, I want to know if I've matured. Your threat to expel me won't deter me if I mess up again. By myself, I will depart. Let me explain why you should leave me. My previous behavior, please give me another opportunity. Do you think I should have it? If my plan came to fruition, Blair, I was hoping we could work out a way to remain a couple. Given that I am not incarcerated, I will grant you one academic year to demonstrate your altered perspective on the family and restore my faith in men. The kids and I may take a vacation at the conclusion of the school year to figure out if we want to stay a family. We may return to Arizona, yes. Have you made arrangements for your woman friend to wait until then to find out whether you're coming back, Archer? It looked like you two got along. Absolutely not. We never made any promises to one another. We might take the kids and go see her and her kids again if she wants us to. Our time together was enjoyable, but we didn't have enough time to settle on any major plans. Next summer, she might even cross paths with someone else. She exudes an irresistible charm. Archer, it's hard to believe you'll really give me a chance knowing she might be waiting for you. That is the matter. Accept it or reject it. I'll accept anything if it means we can live together once more. Will it be better if we formalize it? A more informal transaction could serve as the sealant in place of a notary. Being with you has been sorely missed. It'll take me some time. Why? Firstly, it's going to take a while to get back in the swing of things after being without sex for so long. I'll make it easier for you. Second, I came back anticipating a storm because of you. I was prepared to put the children out of my mind and go on. I believed that my absence was a prerequisite for your transformation. Prior to my intervention, your interactions with you were poisonous. Your promise that you won't go back to your former ways is hard to believe. I get that you have reservations. Until I prove that, you shouldn't trust me. That being said, I am unable to accomplish that task in the absence of an opportunity from you. The nine months is okay with me. Although I would prefer to begin with just one bedroom, I can wait if that is your preference. If given the opportunity, I will do nearly anything again. Going through the asylum, jail, being alone, and financially strapped was a harsh lesson. Even in my darkest times, I believed you and the kids would return. I promised myself I wouldn't mess up my family again if given the chance. 
Let's take it slow, but give it an honest effort, both of us. Please. Blair. I'll need a few days to think this through, but the deal is starting to make more sense. Anything else you'd want as part of it? Just one thing. If you see me slipping back into old habits, a real 2x4 would hurt less. Since the two sides were amicable in their resolution of the domestic issue, the district attorney's office decided not to press charges against Archer. Final thoughts. A pattern emerged during the subsequent nine months. As time went on, the family began to recover. The children went back to school, and Blair and Archer went back to work. At the three-month mark, they were back to being intimate, and they started sharing the master bedroom, schedules, the kids' activities, and their feelings toward the marriage were common topics of discussion after the kids went to bed. Archer didn't tell Blair that he'd hired a private investigator to make random checks and found nothing disturbing in her relationships with other men, but he did recognize that Blair's attitude had improved. However, Archer couldn't help but think that his Arizona acquaintance Leslie could have something unique to offer, even as he acknowledged Blair's efforts. Even though Blair had done a lot to make him contemplate being together, he still planned to spend the summer in Arizona with the kids, he told Blair as summer neared. Their return was something Leslie had already expressed her desire for. Even after nine months of trying, Blair couldn't shake the suspicion that her husband's return had been nothing more than a cruel ploy. As her family drove away, she kept her composure, trying to hide her sadness until the automobile was out of sight. After that, she sobbed herself to death in the living room. She was terrified that this may spell the end of her marriage. At the same time, Leslie greeted Archer and his children with love and hospitality. More beautiful than he'd remembered, she appeared to him. Their closeness was more than he had imagined, and it was something he had fantasized about on evenings spent with Blair. They adapted to their new family dynamic and quickly established routines, sharing responsibilities around the house. At first, Archer was fine with working from home while Leslie kept her regular nine to five. When the kids weren't at camp, he was the one in charge of watching them. Archer started having flashbacks about the third week when Leslie started telling him what to do instead of asking him to do it because she expected him to change the sheets and make the bed because he wasn't in the office. Despite her quick apology, Leslie's answer to his suggestion to hire help hurt because it implied his need for another woman's company. On the surface, everything seemed okay, but Archer couldn't get rid of his anxiety. How Leslie, a woman as alluring and sexually charged as herself, could have maintained her celibacy for nine months was a mystery to him. When he accidentally ran into one of her co-workers, she spilled the beans about their office's policy on Friday afternoons, confirming his suspicions. Despite Archer's wife's ignorance, an investigator dug up proof of Leslie's weekly boss. Arranged covert meeting. Leslie came home one Friday night to discover a note telling her where her children were. Archer and his children had departed. He purposefully shared the proof with the boss's wife and left behind a photo showing Leslie in an inappropriate position with her boss. Archer returned to Blair without informing her in advance, hoping that the journey would give him time to think of a way to break the news that Leslie hadn't been the best option after all. He was ready to apologize for his harsh treatment of Blair and hoped that Blair would forgive him for his relationship with Leslie. He felt terrible about his treatment of Blair and realized the gravity of his actions. When they arrived at the house, it was completely dark. The hood of Blair's automobile remained icy as it sat in the driveway well into the afternoon. The air was heavy with an unsettling stillness. Archer unlocked the door and retrieved their bags as soon as he saw the mail gushing out of the box. There was complete stillness as their cries for Blair reverberated through the deserted halls. As he made his way upstairs, he noted that, unlike Blair's normal fastidious practices, nothing appeared to have fallen apart except for a thin layer of dust. Everything in the fridge had mold on it, and it was almost empty. Anxiety started to bite him. Archer sent the kids to watch TV after Vicky hurried over as soon as they arrived. He looked to Vicky with trembling hands. Where's Blair? Archer, 
When you went to Arizona, she fell into a deep depression. She stopped eating, worked minimally, and spent her time staring at old photos. Waiting for any word from you, she was losing weight dangerously. We got concerned she might harm herself. She's in treatment, but she didn't want us to call you, said you had something important and that she shouldn't interfere. She nearly lost it when I mentioned calling you. Where is she? Farmdale. She started treatment last week. We plan to contact you tomorrow, despite her wishes. What are you going to do, Archer? Vicky, does your husband have a 2x4 wooden post in his workshop? He asked after a lengthy pause. Why? I think it's time I work on my marriage. Even if it's the hard way.